Uh, hello, my name is Elliot Yu. I'm editor of Personal Finance and the Energy Strategist. Uh, today I want to talk a little bit about uh, the big news, which of course is the uh, Gulf oil spill, uh, what I think that means for energy stocks generally, um, and also for oil and other energy-related commodities. Um, one of the first things to mention is that, um, you know, a lot of times when a disaster like this strikes, you know, undoubtedly a disaster, um, you know, the, the, the headlines you get from the, from the general media tend to be very sensationalist. Um, now that has upside and downside. Now the upside of that, uh, which is what we really should be most concerned with, um, is that it hits a lot of stocks uh, that really aren't going to be that badly affected by the spill. Um, they sort of get caught up in the whole media maelstrom surrounding uh, a disaster like this. Um, and if you look at it, um, actually, though it is the largest spill um, in the U.S., in U.S. history, and the history of the U.S. energy industry, it might not even be the largest spill in the history of the Gulf of Mexico. Um, specifically, I'm talking about the 1979 Ixtac spill in Mexico. Uh, that spill ended up lasting about 10 months, uh, and, it, and it spilled a total of about 3.3 million barrels of oil. Uh, now, it's totally unclear at this point uh, exactly how much oil has been coming out of the Macondo well since the beginning, um, how much it might have been stepped up as a result of them cutting the riser pipe off of the, off of the well, and exactly how much they're capturing in terms of the percentage of the total amount spilling. Uh, but it looks like there's a pretty good chance this spill will actually be smaller than that 1979 spill in the Gulf. Um, now, of course, that spill was in shallow water, uh, whereas in the, this is in 5,000 feet of water. Uh, but drilling technology has really improved, and one of the reasons that this is likely to be plugged in August uh, is because they're able to drill those relief wells a lot faster today uh, than they were back in 1979, where it took over 10 months, really, to fully uh, plug the well and, and drill those relief wells. Um, and one of the things to remember about that as well is, though, you know, both are, were disasters in terms of uh, the local environment. Um, a lot of scientists were actually surprised at how quickly the Gulf bounced back from the Ixtox spill. Uh, another thing to point out is that uh, actually every year some scientists believe as much as 1.5 million barrels of oil naturally seep into the Gulf of Mexico uh, from underground reservoirs uh, just naturally leaking into the Gulf. Um, so I, I guess the point I'm trying to make is that it may not be the calamity that some are making it out to be on the news. A lot of that is really just sensationalist headlines to get attention. Um, who's going who's gonna to be the obvious loser out of this? Well, obviously it's going to be BP. Um, not only is BP the, uh, the large majority stakeholder in it, of course they were the operator. They had about 65% stake of this well. They're going to be responsible for all of the upfront costs. Um, now there are other partners in the well, uh, Anadarko and Mitsui. Anadarko has a 25% stake. Uh, if you're looking to play a company directly involved in the well, I would rather go with Anadarko than BP. Uh, the reason being is that Anadarko, uh, though they have a stake in the field, probably will have some liability. There is a clause in the agreement between Anadarko and BP uh, that says in the event of gross negligence, so if BP is found to have done something actually wrong, uh, they'll actually probably be able to sue and end up not having to pay uh, much out of this well. Uh, meanwhile, they have some pretty amazing discoveries offshore West Africa, uh, which I think uh, really give them a lot of fundamental upside. Uh, looking a little bit further down uh, the line, uh, the most damaging uh, thing to come out of this spill uh, from, an from an energy industry standpoint isn't really the spill itself, it's this six-month moratorium. Um, the six-month moratorium is extremely strict. Uh, it applies to all wells drilled in waters more than 500 feet, and it also uh, has been extended from just new wells, in other words, not permitting new wells, to actually causing uh, companies to stop drilling wells that they'd already started drilling uh, as soon as it's safe to do so. Uh, two things to note. Uh, first of all, 500 feet, uh, very unusual standard there. Uh, the MMS, or the government, has traditionally defined deep water as wells in waters more than 1,000 feet deep. Um, so making it wells uh, more than 500 feet deep, you're actually capturing a lot of wells that would traditionally be considered shallow water wells. Um, the second point is that it's affecting pretty, it's a pretty much across the board moratorium, affecting wells that haven't started drilling yet as well as wells that have already started drilling. Uh, it affects about 33 deep water rigs. Uh, now these deep water rigs, uh, these contract drillers, companies like Transocean, which was a company involved in Macondo, uh, the way these contracts work is that they're typically long-term contracts. In other words, a company like BP or Anadarko or Exxon 
will contract to rent these rigs uh, for several years for a fee called a day rate. Now those day rates can be $600,000 or, or, or even higher uh, for some of these deep water rigs. However, uh, there are out clauses. Uh, they can uh, declare what's called force majeure uh, if there's a disruption outside their control uh, and this would certainly qualify there. Uh, so what typically happens is after a period of time, they're able to declare force majeure, uh, then they get a reduced day rate. Uh, so the contract driller would get a reduced day rate for a period of time followed by being totally released from the contract. So in other words, that would mean that those rigs would have to move elsewhere. This is a major problem. Um, the deep water golf was considered one of the most interesting areas of uh, future exploration and production in the world. Um, it's part of what I call the deep water golden triangle, which is uh, deep water Brazil, deep water Gulf of Mexico, and deep water offshore Africa. Um, if this moratorium is extended, even if this moratorium is just six months, but certainly if it's extended beyond that, uh, which a lot of people believe is, is likely to happen, uh, it will mean that most of those rigs, if not all of those rigs, will actually leave the Gulf of Mexico and look for contracts elsewhere. Um, that's a problem both for the drilling contractor as well as for the industry as a whole. Uh, for the drilling contractor, those rigs are going to have to be bid on contracts elsewhere around the world. 33 rigs is a lot of rigs, so those rigs are all going to be competing with one another uh, for contracts. Therefore, they're not likely to get anything close to the day rates that they were getting in the Gulf of Mexico. So that means lower profits for a lot of those drilling contractors uh, with exposure to the Gulf. The longer the moratorium lasts, the worse it's going to be. From a U.S. standpoint, the big problem that I see is that a lot of these rigs are going to be relocated out of the Gulf and then re-signed on contracts elsewhere, working on other deals. A lot of the other support staff, like the services staff, company, uh, uh, workers for companies like Schlumberger, uh, companies like Baker Hughes, they're also going to be moved elsewhere on international contracts. Even when that moratorium is lifted, say six months or a year from now, those rigs and those people are not necessarily coming directly back to the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, what that means is that up to a third of U.S. production could be uh, in, in jeopardy eventually. Uh, but what's even more important than that is that the EIA, the Energy Information Administration, uh, the IEA, and other groups that sort of model uh, production growth from the United States and other countries outside OPEC had been penciling in a lot of growth from the Deepwater Gulf in terms of production. Um, that pretty much will have to be scratched out now, um, or certainly revised and pushed further out into the future. Uh, and what that means is lower U.S. production, lower non-OPEC production, and ultimately higher oil prices. Uh, right now, uh, oil prices have been pulled back a lot in response to general concerns about the global economy, uh, but I think that we'll continue to see kind of a cyclical recovery, a slow recovery in countries like the U.S. and, and Europe uh, in terms of oil demand. Uh, in fact, right now, oil demand is up almost 8% year over year in the U.S. Uh, and when that hits lower supply and lower supply growth potential from countries like the U.S., that spells much higher oil prices. I stick by my prediction for $100 oil before the end of this year, and I think we'll probably see new highs in oil uh, over the next couple of years or so. Uh, and the longer this moratorium lasts, um, the worse that's going to be. Uh, in terms of looking for plays, uh, a couple of areas. First of all, uh, look for companies involved in deep water drilling and services that have been hit but really don't have that much exposure to the Gulf. Uh, some examples would be the big services names. Yes, they're going to get hit in the sense that they're going to lose profits over the next few quarters because they're going to have to relocate all their equipment and labor out of the Gulf. Uh, but longer term, a company like Schlumberger probably has less than 10% of their revenue uh, is exposed to the U.S. market or the deep water Gulf. Uh, they'll be able to make it up elsewhere, especially with oil prices where they are today. Other companies to look at on the contract drilling side, different contract drillers have varying exposure to the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, the ones that are going to get really hurt are those that have to move rigs out of the Gulf, again, and accept much lower day rates. But there are a couple that get very, very minor exposure to the Gulf. They have long-term contracts covering their rigs elsewhere. They probably will see little or no impact. And the beauty of it is uh, some of them actually pay very, very high dividends as well. Uh, so there are some opportunities out there, but longer term, the Macondo disaster probably means much higher oil prices, much lower U.S. oil production. Thank you very much.